welcome people uh, join uh, people are joining from uh, all over the world it seems okay we've got 13 so I'll make a start so yes welcome everyone today we have people joining us from around Australia New Zealand Hong Kong and Singapore we're very happy to have you with us today my name is Sam Snutch uh, I am a mechanical engineer with WSP and a member of the SIBSI New South Wales Committee. I will chair today's SIBSI accredited session on gasketed plate and frame heat exchangers. Whilst everyone continues to sign in, I will run through some SIBSI ANZ initiatives slides before our expert speaker for today presents. I'd first like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. Where I am in Sydney, this is the Gadigal of Eora people. I would like to acknowledge the owners of country through Australia and recognize their continued protection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. SIBSI Australia and New Zealand is excited to confirm that our Young Engineers Award for 2021 will now take place all online on Thursday, the 18th of November. This will allow us to celebrate with all finalists, both near and far. This will enable us to circumvent the restrictions on travel and large gatherings. This regional award function is free to join and we welcome SIPSI members and industry guests to register for their long awaited celebrations and the announcement of winners. This event will include a special guest speaker, Greens MP Marine Faruqi, and networking in the virtual lounge after the formal announcements. Please use this QR code to register for a free ticket or follow the links from the sibsi.org.au. We hope to see many of you there. If you are not yet a SIBSI member, you can join today and gain access to the following knowledge projects, products and services for 15 months. You get monthly subscriptions to the leading building services magazine, the SIBSI Journal, worth 120 Australian dollars, you get limited digital access to over, oh sorry, unlimited digital access to over 950 built environment guides, publications and research reports. 20% off SIBSI training and savings of up to $350. Exclusive discounts on local and international events and recorded content. Guidance and Discounts on upgrading to corporate membership grades with professional registration. Again, please scan the QR code or visit sibsi.org uh, to apply today. Did you know that you can tap into hours of free webinar, and co co webinar content from around the region and the world with Sibsi ANZ? webinars. This on-demand library covers a wide range of building services engineering expert guidance to satisfy your thirst for knowledge. Follow the link from sibsi.org.au to CBD webinars. Okay, well that, that concludes the, uh, the preamble um, with Sibsi's announcements for today. So before I introduce Surya to take us through. Okay, welcome everyone. That's, my notes have gone. Well, I introduced to Surya. Now I, I would like to say you, you're welcome to use the Q&A comments throughout the presentation and we'll have some time for the comments at the end. Uh, so yeah, please, uh, any comments we'll, uh, or questions we, we can pick up at the end. We'll, we'll start now the, the formal 45 minute or so presentation. Thanks, Surya. Thanks, Sam. I'm assuming that you can see my screen. 
we can. Oh, great. Thank you. And thanks, Sibsi, for hosting us today. And welcome, everyone, to this training for the gasketed play, um, plate and frame heat exchanges. I hope that it gives you some insights into the workings of heat exchanges, and they have evolved since um, 1931. In fact, the first plate heat exchanger was born from the need to process milk in the dairy industry, and I hope that you find today's information useful. So... Here is a look at what we will be covering today and the learning objectives of this presentation. I'm not sure if you've seen a heat exchange in operation and sometimes they go unnoticed for years before a building manager or service manager realizes that they are not achieving the temperature that they are required to before, um, or before a leak starts occurring. However, they are a crucial part of the cooling and heating system, which can significantly impact the energy consumption of the building. So what is a heat exchanger? Heat can be exchanged in two different ways, direct and indirect. A heat exchanger is the device used to transfer thermal energy from one fluid to another. And both fluids are completely separated by the heat exchanger. They should never meet or mix. The fluids can be anything such as water, oil, refrigerant, and the fluids must always be at different temperatures. So to transfer heat, um, normally heat, it would, you know, energy would flow from the hot to the cold side. So there are many types of heat exchangers and they're used in almost all manufacturing processes. Um, so you would see quite a few different ones there. And um, you would find gasketed plate heat exchangers in most of these industries. Um, you'd find them for heavy duty applications for HVAC, as well as industrial and process engineering applications. And for example, in, in district heating and cooling networks, to connect buildings to the networks of gasketed plate heat exchanges installed between the building, central plant and the circuit, and the district network. And they can be used as an interchanger in a cooling tower system where they are located close to the cooling tower to protect the plant from harmful effects, fouling and accumulated minerals. Um, a plate heat exchanger can be implemented both for existing cooling towers and for new cooling tower purchases. And this results in downstream plant equipment savings with better heat energy transfer. Um, and the ultimate goal is to reduce maintenance costs and um, reduce replacement or repair costs. So you'll find gasket of plate heat exchangers used in many HVAC applications to indirectly connect chillers, boilers, um, cooling towers. They're used in economizer circuits um, and heat recovery circuits to reduce the cooling load on the chillers. Many industrial plants will use plate heat exchangers for many things such as pasteurization, waste heat recovery, and in marine data centers and now clean tech, as we at Alpha Level call it, for example, in thermal energy storage, heat pumps, etc. So it has a wide range of applications. And here you can see the components um, and all gasket plate heat exchangers um, have a similar construction. The frame plate is at the front of the unit where you can see the portholes containing linings and stud bolts. And there are three types of linings available for gasketed plate heat exchangers. You sometimes see no lining, um, meaning the frame is exposed to the fluid. You see rubber lining or metal linings. Um, and not all companies supply all these bits and pieces, but um, you sometimes find stud bolts and liners, for example, not always supplied. But normally we recommend that linings in the ports together with high quality steel and assembly work to prevent leakage offers a long-term sustainable solution. Um, as the pipes containing the fluid is going to be connected here. So the frame plate is fixed into position, whereas the pressure plate on the other side is able to slide back and forward for opening and closing of the unit. And to facilitate easy opening of the plate exchanger, the pressure plate must be easy to move and slide along the carry bar in order to gain access to the plate pack. Um, to achieve this, the pressure plate must have some kind of roller function built into it. And the most common solution is a roller on top of the carry bar, which makes it easy and less time consuming to conduct the service. The support column and the carry bar guide the rest of the components into place. And the plate pack is assembled by adding one plate at a time. And you will see this in a short video next. And finally, some typing bolts are covered with protective sheets. 
And sometimes when I walk through plant rooms, I often see that some of them are being, have been have gone astray. And I wonder what people use them for. Anyway, these are placed into position and they are tightened to the correct measurement to ensure the plate or to, to ensure a pressure tight seal is formed. So when units have been manufactured, they normally are pressure tested to ensure that there are no leaks present and no damage present on the internals. Now, as you know, plate heat exchangers normally need some kind of feet on the frame plate for stability. And depending on the size and the weight, feet are also necessary um, on the pressure plate of some plate heat exchangers. You may also notice some extra components which are included on larger units to help with maintenance. And these could be bearing boxes, for example, to reduce the friction when opening and closing these units. Um, and you will also see locks, um, lock washers, which prevent the nut or bolt heads from rotating during operation and closing to make this um, servicing a lot easier. So here is a short, very creative video, as you will see, to show you the components and the assembly process. So you can see the stud bolts there, the support column, carry bar at the very top, and then tightening bolts, which um, would normally come through next. They go on, if you notice, in a particular sequence. So that's a very quick um, look at you know how this operates. Uh, how does this work? So the heat transfer surface in a plate heat exchanger are the channels that are formed between the metallic plates in the plate pack. They are always two mediums. I'll run this video, one hot and one cold. And they flow through alternate channels, as you can see. And there's gaskets between the plates to direct the two medias into the correct channel and stop the fluids from mixing. And the plate pack and the gaskets are sandwiched between two of the frame plates and held together and kept in pressure with large tightening bolts through the plate. Um, and you can specify in your design which side you want to have your hot and your cold sides as well. So all plate heat exchanges look very similar on the outside, but the difference really lies on the inside in the details of the plate design. And as you can see in the sealing technologies that are used, here you can see a more in-depth detail, um, detail look at the plate. The manufacturing of plate heat exchanges have come a long way. The first plate plates that we used um, were manually carved on sheets of metal that were too thick to press. And now we are able to use thin sheets of metal, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 plates, 0 0.6 um, starts getting up there. And depending on the pressures that, are using, that you were using, and these are mechanically pressed to form the plate pattern, which gives its mechanical strength. So during the pressing, the surface of the metal sheet is um, to a high extent elongated. Hence, one of the most important properties of the metallic plate is its elasticity. So at the very top there, you can see the carry bar slot. Um, and this is used to line the plates onto the unit and keep them in place. You have the inlet and outlet ports where the primary and secondary fluids will be on opposite parallel sides of the fluid. And you can see how the gasket separates the two fluids with the O-ring on one of the ports. And this will alternate on each plate to ensure that the fluids remain independent. On the right hand side is the safety chamber. The role of the safety chamber is to reveal gasket failure and um, special venting ports located gives an early indication of um, leakages. And this venting port arrangement is an integral part of the gasket design. Should either of these gaskets, um, should either of this fail, the leaking fluid will enter the safety chamber and then be drained to atmosphere um, via the, the venting ports. So the leakage will be early um, detected early, which means less production losses. Um, however, for critical applications, obviously, we would like to see maintenance that is supported well and truly before this happens. So you can also see gasket clips for non-glued gaskets. However, you can also have, um, you, you also get non-glued and glued options. Um, the distribution area and the 
So the distribution area and heat transfer surface are areas in which the, um, the fluid will pass through the plate. And plate heat exchangers have a major advantage over conventional heat exchangers in that the fluids are exposed to a much larger surface area because the fluids are spread out over the plates. And um, with the fact that we use such thin plates of metal, um, it makes the plate heat exchanger really efficient and um, a great method of transferring heat, which increases the speed of temperature change. So this um, is where the magic happens. The plate pattern is also important and it is um, designed to best suit the duty and the application to achieve the best heat transfer all the way down to the plate. The distribution area is one of the most important features of a plate. And you would find in recent years, that's where the most technology has been invested. Its main, its, um, main feature is to ensure an even flow of fluid over the entire plate. And maldistribution over a fluid, over a, of fluid over a plate can lead to a number of serious problems, such as potential heat transfer losses, the introduction of fouling, as you can see there, um, and uneven temperature zones. So in turn, this leads to really unnecessary energy losses and increased maintenance costs. Um, so you can see from this photo, um, there has been quite bad distribution and fouling has built up along one side of the plate. The pressing pattern in the heat transfer surface area also is important um, to ensure a strong plate um, that can handle pressure shocks, vibration, fatigue, high pressures. This pattern can affect the heat transfer efficiency of the unit. Um, and we will discuss this in more great, um, detail as we move along. So the right amount of surface area is important. So having more area is not a benefit. Um, as additional area is installed at the back of the unit in parallel, um, we end up with more area that is need than is needed. And the flow rate of the channel reduces, which means lower turbulence, faster fouling. So this, um, this video actually shows the distribution area. So you'll see it moved down the curve flow with a nice even velocity down the plate pack, you know, encouraging that great turbulence which you want to see going through to keep those channels nice and clean. Um, so th this is why having a correctly designed heat exchanger will ensure that you have those constant clean channels increasing the, um, the lifespan of this um, unit. So a little bit of theory here. <laughs> When talking about heat exchange efficiency as a useful concept is the NTU value, as we know it with now follow bell, the theta value. Sometimes this value is referred to as thermal length. NTU stands for the number of transfer units, and it is a measure of how difficult the thermal duty is from a thermal perspective. So the NTU can be calculated for both the hot and the cold side, according to the equations on the slide. And it has significance in heat recovery duties, where it is an expression of the thermal effectiveness of the heat exchanger, and often used as a guideline when selecting the appropriate plate heat exchanger. The plates can be designed into what are commonly referred to as high or low theta plates, and the theta value of a duty can be calculated for both the hot and cold sides, which makes it possible to design a heat exchanger that best fulfills the customer needs. And there are three things that can affect whether the plate is high or low theta. Firstly, the pressing depth. The smaller pressing depth is better for a high theta duty. The plate length, the taller the plate, the fluid has a longer travel through the plate, making these better for a high theta duty. And lastly, the chevron angle. So the larger the chevron angle, the harder it is for the fluid to get down the plate. So the larger the angle, the higher the theta duty. So I hope I, hope I haven't confused you yet, but we keep going. So there are plate, two plate configurations. We've got the low and the high, and these form different channels. So you've got the low, the medium, and the high. Um, a channel is the space between two plates, and I'm not sure if you can see this, um, but that is, that is the channel between plates. So that's a cross section. Um, 
So the channel for either low, medium, high, um, or combination, depending on how low theta and high theta plates are combined to create the channel. Um, optimal channel type is selected on the basis of the temperature program to be satisfied and the maximum pressure drop allowance. So low theta channel, low, low channel, low turbulence, low pressure drop. High channel, high turbulence, high pressure drop, and medium is in between. And just to confuse you a little, the latest plate technology allows asymmetric channels to cope with varying flows between the hot and the cold sides. So now you can get a combination of these, which results in the smallest heat exchanger footprint. And I don't know if you can see this, but I've just got some little down a little bit. Look at some little plates here. So you can see this is pretty much a standard, you know, selection of plates. And depending on how these are configured. So if you look through this, you can then start to see some channels forming. And so depending on what your flow rates, your pressure drops are, these plates on the inside can be configured to ensure that you end up with the smallest possible heat exchanger. Of course, not all suppliers have this, but hopefully there is a renewed appreciation of the technology behind this. So why is this important in designing? The low theta channel has low turbulence and pressure drops, and the channels that are formed in the high theta plates of a heat exchanger are extremely efficient in creating high turbulence and increased heat recovery, meaning most applications and demands can be met in a single pass unit um, where the flow of the fluid goes from the top connection to the bottom connection. So heat exchangers are constantly being developed to become more efficient and sustainable. Um, and with duties and industry demands giving theta values and requesting better heat recovery rates, we have various options. So in the instance of very high theater duties, it is possible to make a multi-pass design. And if there is no plate that fits a single pass, um, by having multiple passes, it effectively increases the surface area as though the plate is longer. So as you can see from the diagram, the more passes you have, the more surface area the fluids will have to pass through. Um, and this can save space by having to use a larger unit or having to use uh, multiple units reducing the footprint. It's all about sustainable solutions. And here is a little video of a multi-pass design. And there you can see a partition plate in the middle of the pack. So as you can see, this has one end of the portholes block, so the fluid will be forced to travel up and over. And the connections are on the frame as well as the pressure plate of the unit. And with mo most multi-pass designs, as you can see, the hot and cold inlets and outlet's position will depend on the number of passes in the unit. So now we move on to plate materials. The type of metal needs to be able to withstand the media at the operating temperature and pressure. There are many metallic materials that can be used in plate heat exchangers. And the most common, commonly used plate material in our plate heat exchangers is stainless steel. So there are several grades of stainless steel and the characteristics of the grades are dependent on the mixture of the elements used. Most commonly there are um, stainless steel compositions of alloy 316 and 304. And 304 can be used in very clean water water duties. However, 316 is used when the water might be less clean and contain a little bit higher chloride concentrations. And bear in mind that around 100 parts per million chloride concentration of town water lowish temperatures and a neutral pH, it might not be ideal for long-term lower grade stainless steel. So 316 is normally the specification. Um, alloy 254 is something used when more corrosive fluids um, are being used as acidic solutions. Um, and other materials include titanium, which you see most commonly in plate heat exchangers for pool water or seawater applications and it can also withstand attacks by chlorine gas and chlorine solutions. Um, nickel is a really niche metal used in 
plate heat exchangers for duties handling high concentrations of cost to get higher temperatures. And you can even get graphite, um, which are used for plate heat exchangers where the corrosion resistance, resistance of common metal materials is too low. So plates can essentially be made with many metals based on the customer's application and what they are willing to pay for. And I'll touch on some other plates, which are less in less familiar applications than you may encounter in the HVAC space. So there are some different plate types, which are specifically designed to handle certain applications. So wide gap plates have a larger pressing depth and a special plate pattern, which creates more space in the channels for the fluids. And this is specially designed to handle fluids containing fibers or particles to minimize blocking and fouling. So semi-welded plates, they designed where two plates are welded together into a case and the ceiling between the plates alternates between laser welds and gaskets. And there is a ring gasket seal between the cassettes and the ring gasket is often made up of specialized materials that um, has to be compatible with the fluid in the welded channel. So these types of plates are used a lot in refrigeration applications where there will be a high design pressure on one side of the exchanger. Um, or in applications where fluids are not compatible with a standard gasket. Um, something else that you might come across is the double wall plate, which consists of two plates pressed together. And um, this will ensure that there is a failure. If there's a failure on a plate, it will be de detected through an external leak. So these plates are often used when extra care is needed to avoid mixing of the fluids. Most of you would have come across nitrile in HVAC applications. Um, for gaskets. However, to be able to work with many different fluids with different characteristics, we offer a range of different gasket materials with different performance limitations. Um, the choice of the rubber material depends on the fluids, the chemicals present, um, the combination of temperature and pressure. Rubber materials change properties as a result of time as rubber relaxes or due to temperature the rubber deteriorates or possibly hardens by attacking of oxidizing agents, for example, oxygen in the air. So you could get swelling or softening by absorption of chemicals in the fluid. And the common gasket types are NBR or nitrile butadiene rubber. Um, NBR is an oil resistant material. It resists mostly bats, oils, lubricants if they are not um, aromatic. And generally, NBR is a lower cost material. Depending on the grade, it can withstand temperatures of 130 degrees. Um, EPDM, um, so this is a gasket material with excellent heat resistance and can withstand higher temperatures up to 180 degrees. And these gaskets are preferred for food grade hygienic applications and steam. Um, so then you get the HNBR, which is a material basically to have the same chemical properties as NDR, resistant to oil, fluids, um, fuels, lubricants, but with enhanced resistance to heat and oxidation. So close to that of EPDM. And then FKM fluorocarbon elastomers, which is a rubber that has excellent chemical resistance to a wide range of substance and it's used for aggressive chemical compounds. And these are all standard materials that you will come across. They are less common materials that, that are found um, and are used more for more special applications such as um, FEPM, silicon or CR or PTFE. So there's many, uh, many options depending on the connect uh, conditions and applications that you have. So the performance of a gasketed plate heat exchanger is influenced by many components and places high demand on the gasket system. So to obtain the highest performance, it is important that the plate and the gasket are designed together. A correctly designed gasket has a high enough sealing force to prevent leakage, but it must not be too high so as to prevent the gasket and gasket groove damage. And this video shows a well-designed gasket that will ensure good sealing and performance to give maximized uptime and savings on spare parts. So you're doing well to keep up, um, hopefully. It, there's a bit of theory here, but, but hopefully, you know, it, it puts things into perspective. So there's a wide portfolio of different gasket and plate heat exchanger products. And when making a selection to design a heat exchanger, you need to consider the capacity, the fluid type, 
the design criteria and the theta value. And of course, our design systems account for this. So the capacity is about how much mass flow the plate heat exchanger should handle. To perform a given duty, the right model of gas per plate heat exchanger is mostly determined by the maximum connection velocity of the fluid with the highest flow rate. So various connection sizes exist, and these are usually fixed depending on the model. In, in industry globally, piping is usually selected based on a two meters per second maximum velocity. And as you are aware, any higher may result in pipe, uh, pipe erosion and any lower may result in sedimentation. So for gasket and plate heat exchanges, the common guide is maximum of around two meters per second at the connection, which is only at the thickness of the frame plate. Um, so there is a reducer and enlarger normally to and from the piping um, of the heat exchanger connection. And large connections are undesired from our point of view, um, which may, because it means that you are selecting a wider plate. And with that, the risk um, of fouling as the fluid does not want to travel the furthest distance from port to port and quite often makes the unit oversurfaced. And if you design a unit to match the pipe sizes that may already be in place, it might not be the best design. Um, the other um, factor is theta. And I've um, gone through theta a little bit. And theta is significant in heat exchange recovery duties. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned, it can be altered depending on the theta duty and whether it's single or multi-pass. And what is the impact of the fluid type on the design criteria? So the design of a plate heat exchanger is dependent on the fluids, the temperatures, the pressures, and it is a liquid, if it's a liquid liquid, or if it's a two-phase condensing or evaporating duty, it's all of importance. So normal gasketed plate heat exchangers are most commonly used once, um, of course, um, though hazardous and dirty fluids as well as condensing or evaporating duties all have their specialized products. There's always a heat exchanger that will fit the purpose. So just quickly, there are two examples of heat exchangers here with the same port size connection. One is a short and wide one and typically used in steam applications. And the other one is a tall and narrow one used for hydraulic brakes with close temperature approaches. So you can see that although the capacity is an important factor on deciding the size of the unit with the connection velocities, these two units are still very different due to their plate type and the application they are being used for. So the variables of plate design make it possible to find good designs for almost all duties. So you may have come across various codes and certification and gasketed plate heat exchangers can be designed in accordance with different pressure vessel codes and certification. So you would see PED, um, which is the pressure equipment directive of the EU. Hence, it's not a pressure vessel code, but its purpose is to harmonize national laws um, of the European Union regarding the design, the manufacture, the testing, the conformity assessment assemblies of pressure equipment. Um, probably more common for um, our colleagues from Asia that have joined us, um, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Code, the ASME, um, provides rules for design, fabrication, and inspection of pressure vessels. Um, and on the occasion, I see it here in Australia, I always query it because often it's, um, it, it's been something that's designed in a data center in the US and, and we've um, obtained it. But um, you also have watermark here, which is um, for certain plate types and gasket materials where you can use the gasket or plate heat exchanger with a watermark approval for potable water. There again, not everybody have, has this. Um, AHRI certification, which is the Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration Institute. Um, it's the only independent third party organization that certifies the performance of plate heat exchangers globally. Um, and it's, it's mandatory in the US. And AHRI is a not-for-profit organization that, that strives um, by its certification programs and standards to assist clients to save energy and improve their productivity and also help to ensure a better environment. So it allows building owners to have a long-term sustainable option rather than the cheapest undersized option. 
Um, and from a supplier's vantage point, it also ensures that contractors are comparing like with like. So gasket and plate heat exchanges are continually improving with a wide range of innovative features and benefits that help and reduce energy bills, which prolongs a reliable operation and simplifies maintenance. The purpose is to end up with a heat exchanger that is that has the smallest footprint and that can offer the most sustainable solution. So some of the features that defines the next generation of gasket and plate heat exchangers, which comes um, when it comes to thermal efficiency, is a good distribution area. Um, a good distribution area is what optimizes the flow of media for better utilization of the whole plate surface. So improving the flow with more even distribution eliminates dead spots and provides a higher thermal efficiency with a reduced risk of fouling. And this in turn means energy savings, low maintenance costs and less time worrying about unplanned stops. The asymmetric channels that I've shown you, um, you know, eliminates the compromise between thermal efficiency and pressure drops for duties with different hydraulic loads on the two sides. This optimizes the maximum thermal efficiency and the lowest pressure drop on both the hot and the cold sides. So the result is high efficiency and reduced fouling for a long-term cost-effective performance. So you would have perhaps noted that the old traditional round port is being superseded um, by a non-circular porthole. And the non-circular porthole offers two ways to save on energy, both higher thermal efficiency and reduced pump costs. And that's because it enhances the flow of the media to give increased throughput, a lower pressure drop and optimal utilization of the plate surface. The offset gasket groove um, is another possibly a newer technology that's been employed where the gasket groove in, is in a special zigzag pattern that offers the greatest possible heat transfer area. So better utilization of the whole plate um, reduces the number of plates that are required um, there again for optimal performance and ensures maximum thermal efficiency for um, greater energy savings. So when it comes to serviceability, there, this is key. Gasket attachment, a well-designed clip for a gasket um, attachment offers superior fastening to the plate. So not only the next generation of gaskets um, stay in place better than before, they're also easier to mount. The good design prevents snaking at closing. And I'm not sure whether you've walked past a plate pack and you've noticed gaskets that are not aligned, um, as we call them, snaking. Um, so maintenance of the heat exchanger would go faster. Plates and gaskets last longer and saves money as a result. The T-bar roller. The pressure plate roller is mounted underneath the carry bar, decreasing the height of the heat exchanger and making maintenance simpler and more cost-effective. The design also protects the roller from jamming. Um, bear in mind that it's many years before these heat exchangers are serviced, um, so they would be in institute for many years and it's important that once you do decide to maintain it, that you don't have jamming um, and damage to the frame. So this allows for easier opening and closing of the unit when, when required. Bearing boxes. So they are large and medium model gasketed plate heat exchanges, which have typing bolts with bearing boxes. And the advantage is that reduces friction when opening and retyping the unit. So one person can easily and safely service the heat exchanger without the need of special tools. And the, um, the bearing box eliminates the hassle of simple nut and washer, where maintenance is quite laborious and time consuming and potentially hazardous. And the compact frame. So the smart guiding bar enables more plates and cassettes in a given frame length. The result is a smaller footprint and it requires less space for plate handling during the service. 
So the design enables a faster and safer service, which minimizes um, downtime and maintenance costs. So now we have talked about what a gasket or plate heat exchanger can do and how we use them. Um, and why might we choose a gasket or plate and frame over other technologies? So there are a range of sizes from small to high capacity duties and compared to a shell and shoe with, you know, with the gasketed plate, it's a compact design. In fact, often it's one tenth of the size. Um, it uses less plant space, obviously weighs much less and when in operation for maintenance, um, it's much easier compared to other solutions. So units are fully openable um, for benefits of cleaning, easy expansion. There's a low maintenance cost, blue free gaskets. Um, it's good for close temperature approaches where the shell and tube is, is not so efficient. However, the materials and the fact that, is, that it is openable is probably the core decision maker. Every unit will have pressure and temperature limits with the pressure limitations imposed by the plate thickness and the frame size with a typical limit of up to 30 bar. So a semi-walled unit can have higher, temperature, um, higher pressures of up to 60 bar. The temperature limit by the gasket material with a range of temps between minus 50 to 180. Um, and this is just a quick illustration. There are many buildings across the world, but this one is in London and it won the Bream Excellence Award where heat exchangers are used as pressure breakers or interchangers. Um, so I hope we've covered many things. What is a heat exchanger? How does it work? Um, you know, gasketed plate heat exchangers, components, plate design, innovations, selection criteria, codes and certification, features and benefits. There's a lot that we've covered in these few minutes. Um, I will open up to any questions. Sam, do you want to? Yeah, that's, that's great, Ria. And yeah, just, just reminding everyone that they can submit their questions on the, the Q&A button. Um, I'll, I'll start with a few of my own. Um, the, uh, that was a great presentation. Um, you talked a lot about heat exchangers being used to protect the rest of the system. But is there anything particular we need to do to protect the heat uh, the plate and frame heat exchanger from the, uh, say, for example, uh, we often see them on uh, cooling tower supplementary loops. Uh, they're on the open side of the tower and then they create a closed loop. Is there anything particular we need to do to protect them? Yeah, so a great cleaning regime, um, regular maintenance of cooling tower would help. Um, and also to ensure that you perhaps are able to do regular checks to ensure that the temperatures that the heat exchanger was designed to perform at is actually what you are achieving. Um, so that's probably the quickest telltale. So when you start to see that fouling has occurred, the initial telltale will be um, to evaluate your BMS system regularly. So yeah, from, from that perspective, a, a great cleaning regime is, is really important. Great. And uh, we, we're often talking about the larger uh, kind of design capacities. Uh, but is there any special consideration we need for heat exchangers for low load conditions? So in terms of design, I, I suppose something I would love to, and it's a great question, is it, two parts to it. So in terms of having a good design, we need to remember that the closer your approach temperatures, the larger the heat exchanger. So for every additional liter, or if you can increase your flow rate marginally, will affect the size of your heat exchanger um, so significantly. So if you are looking at designing a heat exchanger, whether it's a low, um, you know, a low temperature approach or a high temperature approach, you need to make sure that you have a correctly designed unit. Um, and, and we can do that quite effectively, even though we say, look, you know, approach temperature of 0.5, it, it should be achieved. But at the end of the day, can you really measure that and how well can you measure that? So 
if you are able to have a conversation with the person that is designing your heat exchanger to ensure that the conditions you're actually running at is what you're going to be designing around. Um, we don't advocate for things like fouling factors, for example, because when you have a fouling factor, you tend to make the plate even larger. And so you're going to have um, the, the flow that's not going to be getting through the last bit of the plate pack, which encourages fouling. So our idea is if you have great turbulence and high shear stress through the plate pack, that is much more beneficial than designing a heat exchanger that has you know, a 10% additional capacity built in. Great, that's really informative. Um, quickly over to the questions coming in from, from people. Uh, somebody's asked whether whether it's possible to get a shell and tube heat exchanger to do the same capacity as a plate and frame? Not always. So with the close approach temperatures, that's quite difficult with shell and tubes. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, there's actually quite a few duties um, that plate heat exchangers can now do because bear in mind that there are so many options now in the plate configuration and the depth of the plate um, of the plate channel gaps, which means that in the old days where we didn't have these sort of wide gaps and where shell and tubes were quite popular, now you don't need to do that. So um, I would always encourage you to ask the question. If you think that you have a shell and tube typical duty, and sometimes I see on a um, on a tender specification, you would see a shell and tube specified, but it is really a plate heat exchanger duty, which is a far more cost effective, far more efficient way of designing. So um, perhaps don't take what you see on a tender for granted. Um, ask the question. Um, you know, sometimes we have our young engineers that are designing um, or, or asking for designs, and we try to educate them in terms of best practice. Um, rather than sort of copy what's been done before. Um, there's a lot of new technologies that are up there and often you can't keep up. So um, please, you know, come to us. We will spend the time talking about the different options um, and the different pressing depths, the different configurations, and hopefully we'll come up with a solution that will be suitable um, and offers you sort of a durable um, long-term solution rather than something that's been designed before and just doing it the same old way. That's great. Um, going back to the questions here, uh, somebody's asked whether the slides will be available. I understand, yes, the slides will be available mm -hmm. after around a week on the, the sipsi.org.au website. So if you missed anything or you want to keep that information, uh, you're encouraged to please go there to find it. Uh, we've got another question uh, around some specific applications and what you would recommend as being the grade of material. Uh, the particular mm -hmm. applications are for a cooling tower, for pool water, and for seawater. So I don't know if you've got some ideas on, on yeah, what you'd so, recommend for those. Yeah, so for cooling tower, um, we obviously, depending on how good your cleaning is, um, but definitely cooling tower 316 as a minimum. Um, 0.4 I see is being more common. Um, we like to use 0.5 because Alpha Laval, you know, I see units that have been there in place for 30 odd years and, and still work. Um, so we always advocate for a durable option, but you know, we have books, we've got 0.4, we've got 0.5 and even thicker. So in general, rule of thumb, I suggest 0.5316 for cooling tower, open cooling tower applications, um, titanium for seawater applications and pool water applications. And with titanium plates, don't forget that the connections or the liners also need to be titanium. Often people might save a few dollars by not having the liners, but you then see on the outside of frame plates, this sort of yellow marking that when it started to deteriorate. So definitely for titanium, um, I would suggest titanium plates, titanium liners, or rubber liners, they, they do as well, um, for pool and seawater applications. And seawater applications, I'd also suggest perhaps a filter just before, um, just before your heat exchanger, as close to your heat exchanger as possible. And we haven't gone through that today, but, but please feel free to 
drop me an email and I can send you some information on that because, you know, we have a great filter that's a set and forget style. Um, and for the, um, what was the last one there, Sam? Uh, got sea water and pool water. So I think, think you covered the, covered the, okay. that's great. Um, we talked a bit about efficiency and it, that's mainly been around pumping efficiency. Uh, when you're using these in perhaps a, uh, a, a cold water or a chilled water application, is, is there also a way of insulating the yes. plate and frame heat exchangers to minimise yeah. heat losses? Mm -hmm. So we have a couple options. One is you can have a very simple protective sheet over the plate pad, but that's not really an insulator. We have a particular totally in compassed um, insulation that can be supplied as an extra. Um, and obviously it's got um, a foam style inner with a, um, an aluminum sheet outer, which retains the heat or the cold, um, depending on what application you're using it for. And um, yeah, so, so there's many options in terms of extras. You just need to ask, ask for it. Of course, I see quite often the aluminum sheeting that's wrapped around, which obviously is quite cost effective, but the difference is that if you have an insulation jacket, you are then able to open it and maintain it and close it. So it's, it's a really nice, clean way of, of maintaining a heat exchanger that's going to be in there for many, many years to come. That's right, it's a bit of a loaded question. And um, we see a lot of um, uh, site installations, so we say, and I think it's good for people to be aware that proprietary equipment is, is available. Um, we've got another one come through uh, about pressure drops. So uh, mm -hmm. generally in, in, in the HVAC environment, what, what type of pressure drops do you tend to see across your systems? So 100 kPa is pretty normal. Um, we do obviously have people that would request 50, 25, depending on what they've got available in terms of their pumps and what's in their system but we like to see a reasonably high pressure drop. And the reason we say that is because during lower demand, where your flow rates drop, let's say your flow rate drops by half, your pressure drop is gonna decrease by a quarter, which means that what happens is that your velocity is going to reduce through the channels. You're gonna get less turbulence, less cleaning and greater fouling. So from that perspective, pressure drop is really important. So if you keep it up at the 100, lower the flows during, you know, lower demand, um, you're not going to start getting fouling that's coming through. So that's where we like to benchmark around 100 kPa. But, um, and, and bear in mind that every kPa makes a difference to the size of your plate pack. So if we have got that additional pressure drop to play with, it will reduce that um, footprint of your heat exchanger and obviously lower the cost. Perfect, so yeah, it's really important to, to consider the, the design flow, but always that operational flow. Uh, another question come in uh, around the out of round ports. Uh, is that a Alpha Laval uh, solution? Yes. Or is that a, no, so it's only available with Alpha Laval, is that right? I'm not sure whether you can see this because I've got a background, but these are Omega ports. Yes, that is a, a patent and product. Alpha Laval has come up with that concept to increase the distribution area. So in, you know, previously with round ports, a reasonable amount of your pressure drop was utilized through the ports, leaving less for the heat transfer through the plate. And so somebody much cleverer than me has come across um, has developed this idea of an Omega port, which increases the path through the channel. And by doing that, you increase the velocity through the traditional dead zone. And so from that perspective, we end up with a smaller heat exchanger than we used to. In fact, if I had to compare our previous um, series to this new series, which we call the T-series, um, we are seeing between five and 20% smaller plate packs that are required because of the new features that this combined with the curve flow and some other gasket features that we've got in that plate. Um, so, you know, if you're talking five to 20%, the, 
thermally more efficient. I think that's a really good, um, really good development. So, you know, I, I look at a heat exchanger and, you know, yourselves as well probably look at a heat exchanger. And they all look very similar, but in terms of what's inside it, it's really quite interesting. And definitely I find it quite interesting anyway. <laughs> So does that mean if we're getting a, a five to ten percent improvement, does that mean that you might decide to reduce the design pressure drop by five and ten percent and get the same performance? Um, well, the whole idea is to come up with the smallest, smallest plate pack, right? So the smallest design. So, you know, a, a reduction or, in or the, or the or the least overall energy use. I suppose it depends on the application. Depends on the right. application, but mostly, I mean, yeah, you want to come up with the small, smallest heat exchanger possible, smallest footprint, lower pumping costs, lower energy consumption, and you know, it, it's just a much more sustainable solution, and that's that's what we want to get to. We want to have in place a heat exchanger that's going to do the job, um, be reliable, perform through the peaks and you know, off peaks. And, and that's another thing that maybe I should mention when you are thinking about a heat exchanger, don't always think about designing at you know, the 90% or the 10% because that 80% is probably where you should try to design and let your pumps compensate or drop down for those other 10% purely because, as I mentioned, if you design for that 90% peak period, then your heat exchanger is gonna be much larger. Um, and so, you know, all those additional um, issues tend to become more prevalent. So just, just some food for thought, something that you can think about when, when you're next looking for a design for a heat exchanger. Great. And we've got uh, one more question come in. So I'll, I'll answer this one. And then this is the last call for questions. So while we're talking about this one, if you this is your last chance to type in a question. Uh, so this question is, when comparing across varying suppliers, why wouldn't the main deciding factor be the heat transfer area? Repeat that for me, Sam. Uh, so the question asked is, when comparing across varying suppliers, why shouldn't the main deciding factor be the heat transfer area? Right. That's a great question because from... From our perspective anyway, there are so many features in this plate that I've gone through. Um, if, if I had to compare just our heat exchangers with what we have now, as opposed to the, the M series, which is the previous series that um, we will be replacing in this T series, the technology is so significant. If I had 20 square meters of the old M series, as opposed to 20 square meters of the new T series, that the efficiencies are going to be so different. Um, you know, that five to 20% is, is what I was talking about. So you can't just look at the surface area and say, okay, this supplier is, um, is the supplier has a larger surface area, so that should be a more efficient plate. No longer is it the case. In fact, sometimes you end up with a worse designed heat exchanger if you just go for that. You need to look at the entire technology of the system rather than just looking at the one um, one dimension, which is the surface area. So no longer can you decide, um, you know, based on surface area, the technology has advanced significantly. And, and bear in mind, I, I remember I had a, a distributor that um, said to me, I, you know, my customer just got this um, heat exchanger and he's concerned that it's not going to do the duty. And I said, why? He said, well, we had one that high and he's now got one that high and um, it's not going to do the job. And I said, well, it will, you know, we guarantee we guarantee any design and our distributors like Masterflow and Industrial Air might be on here, they will guarantee for us our design. So um, be assured that if we are quoting you a heat exchanger that has smaller surface area, we, we will guarantee that thermal performance. Um, so, you, don't, you know, there's no need for us to, to disclose or make sure that we have the surface area the same as our competitors anymore. It, it's just, um, it's not a good way to compare. That's great. Uh, really knowledgeable answers there. Thank you very much for your time. If there's no more questions coming through, I think it's uh, it's now 1.30. So we might wrap it up there. So again, Surya, thank you for your time.
Thank you all for listening and please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is there if there's any other questions. Perfect. And remember that you can download the slides in roughly a week off of the sibsi.org.au website. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Bye now. Yes.